today. So that's a true we're looking at the actual framework for environmental So we're going to look at environmental law. So environmental issues are prominent today. So also taking proactive steps to just like climate change are no longer dismissed means that are being aggressively tackled by environmental laws prohibiting the emission of greenhouse gases among others. We see people trying to remove uh, pollution from oceans. We see people um fly the have now welcomed the idea that there is a need for mutual protection. Now, let's look at the conceptual framework for this module. That is not me. And I remember in primary school we used to learn uh, in that way that the environment is everything that is not me. <laughs> it was quite interesting, but um, there are some definitions we will look at from various attitudes that are very specific in trying to uh, encompass everything that is the environment. Now, we have the definition from the Queensland's Australia Local Government Planning and Environmental Act of 1990. This one defines the environment to include ecosystems and their constituent parts, including people and communities, all natural and physical resources, those qualities and characteristics of locations, places and areas, however large or small, which contribute to the biodiversity integrity, intrinsic and attributed uh, scientific value or interest, amenity, harmony, and sense of community, the social and economic, aesthetic, cultural conditions which affect the matters of, referred to above, which are affected by those matters. Just the definition of, uh, alone is uh, induces a cup of water for it. <laughs> it's quite long, but they are trying to encompass everything that would um, necessarily be part of the environment. And then we have the NEMA definition, as you can see, um, if you read out the NEMA definition, it's also quite long trying to cooperate everything that may be within the definition. Now, what does our national legislation say the environment is? It says that the environment is the natural and man-made resources, physical resources, both biotic and abiotic uh, occurring in the lithosphere and atmosphere, water, soil, minerals, living organisms, whether indigenous or exotic, and the interactions between them, ecosystem, habitats, spatial surroundings, or other constituent parts, whether natural or modified or construed by people and communities, including urbanized areas, agricultural areas, rural landscapes and places of cultural significance, the economic, social, cultural and aesthetic conditions, qualities that contribute to the value of the matter set out in paragraph A and B. So that is the definition of environmental law. It is quite specific, at least it tries. Um, and then uh, it is not as broad as Einstein's definition, but they do try to give and more specific aspect. Now, the scope of environmental law. As we discussed in class, um, the scope of environmental law is quite um, 
it is an interesting subject that has been debated over. What is environmental law? Of all the legal policies that are there, which of those policies would constitute environmental law, would fall under the field of environmental law? How do you establish that this policy is an environmental law? Well, Cohen, Cohen uses the subject matter approach. This view poses that environmental law consists of all legal uh, principles which have in common not so much their special character, but the subject matter they regulate. Right? So the subject matter that they regulate involves environment, the environment, then it constitutes the environmental law now. There are two issues that fall within that, in the use of that approach. One, what subject matter qualifies as falling under the general topic of environmental law? Does that encompass public health as well as conservation, pollution control, and land use? We're not quite sure. The agreed subject matter corresponds largely to the meaning of environmental law. So, looking at the meaning of environmental law set out by Emma, any legislation that falls within the orbit of what is um, incorporated in the, in the meaning of environmental law would constitute environmental law. <laughs> now, another uh, issue that falls within that ambit is the issue to what degree does legal principles, um, to what degree do the legal principles have to relate to environmental management to qualify as environmental law? Uh, if, if just a mere mention of environmental aspects within the legislation, does that make it an environmental law? So those are the issues that come up when we are using the subject matter approach by Cohen. Now, we have also the Rabi continuum. He approaches the question for what is environmental law identifying a continuum of legal principles ranging from those relating to environmental management to those which do not re relate to environmental to the environmental problems or principles. Now, he says that the categories A and uh, B would qualify as environmental law, while G does not qualify. Now, the controversies lie between in the categories starting from C to F. <laughs> right, <laughs> excuse me. Rabid knows that purely exploitative legislation would not constitute environmental law, but if legislation governing environmental exploitation contains provision we seek to minimize the harmful impact upon the environment, then that, that legislation would qualify as environmental law. Right. So, if legislation, legislative provisions are relating to things that would exploit the environment, let's say um, the Mines and Minerals Act, if it is merely just stating how we would further regulate ourselves while we are digging for minerals, then it does not qualify as environmental law. This is according to Rabi. It only qualifies if that provision includes some provision that are helping to minimize the envir the the environmental impact of such activities. Then it would qualify as environmental law. But Fuller disagrees. He says that even exploitative provisions are also environmental law. And even Kidd also knows that any legal principle which relates to environmental management whether directly or indirectly, or which is actual or potential impact on the environment, should fall within the purview of environmental law. So Kidd agrees um, with Fowler's approach, right? So this is how, over the years, they've tried to identify environmental laws. Now, remember the principles that we talked about when we were dealing with international environmental law? Well. Those principles are clearly set out, right? We have political principles, precautionary principles, duty of care, 
to avoid harm to the environment, life cycle responsibility, environmental justice, public trust doctrine, preventative principles, responsibility for transboundary harm, transparency, public participation, access to information, sustainable development. Please look into all those different principles. I will not be able to look into each and every one of them. And this list also is not exhaustive. Look into those principles and familiarize yourself with them. Now, all those principles and the laws and um, the need for us to know what the environment is, we are trying to protect the environment. Now, the question comes in and says, why are we even protecting the environment in the first place? Now, there are different approaches or uh, reasons why there is a certain need for environmental protection. There's the anthropocentric approach. Uh, this approach, um, it sees the environment as something that is for the benefit of mankind. It is looking at the environment in a utilitarian rationale. Uh, environmental law is often aimed at protection control, pollution control, and the con conservation of natural resources to ensure that the environment stays or remains useful for human beings rather than it being seen as a having value in its own right. So, anthropocentric approach, they're saying we are protecting the environment because it benefits human uh, humanity. And we are protecting it so that it continues to benefit the humanity. The environment in itself does not deserve uh, protection in its own right, but it deserves protection for the betterment of humanity. That is the anthropocentric approach or the utilitarian approach. Now, this is completely opposed to the biocentric approach or the ecocentric approach. Uh, which is an ethical worldview that says that all living things carry an inherent value and are therefore to be considered morally. Um, the examples of biocentrism include embracing vegetarianism, being anti-deforestation, opposing the fur trade, and opposing animal testing. So, Biocentrism comes in and says, let's protect the environment because in its own right, it deserves protection. It is a living organism just like us human beings, and it deserves its own protection. Right? We should not look at it vis-a-vis -vis benefits for mankind. So those are the various uh, approaches to the reasons for environmental protection. And then we have the religious uh, viewpoint uh, stems from Judaism, Christian, and Islam, which all hold that human being, a human being is not the ultimate being, but is a product of God's creation, as it is the earth and all plants and animals. So here, yeah, in, in the religious reason for environmental protection, they're looking at the fact that human beings and the environment uh, are all created by God. We are all living creations and the nature has a right to exist on um, over and above its utility to human beings. So this one, it's, it, it, it has traces of uh, ecocentrism or biocentrism. And then we have uh, other reasons. We have land, land ethic, deep ecology, world law and sustainable development. So all these reasons, um, there are different reasons why different people are seeking for environmental protection. Some are embedded in the ecocentric approach, others are founded on the anthropocentric approach, others are founded on deep ecology, land ethic. Land ethic says that all ethics is so far evolved uh, are premised on that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instinct is to com compete for his place in that community, but his ethics prompt, prompt him to cooperate in order that there may be a place uh, to, complete for, to compete for. So, let ethic recognize the inter interdependence of 
the communal environment, right? It appreciates that there's an interdependence that is there and our ethics, right, um, compel us to protect the environment knowing that we, it is, we are somewhat dependent on it, right? right. So all, all these are different reasons for environmental protection. Now, from all those different reasons that have been uh, laid out, yeah, our constitution, by including environmental rights as fundamental justifiable rights, by necessity, its necessary implication requires environmental consideration um, to be accorded appropriate recognition. Together with the change in the ideological climate, must also come a change in our legal and administrative approach to environmental concern. So this is a quote from the Seb Duval environment case um, that just um, just like South Africa, Zimbabwean law uh, have incorporated um, the right to a safe and healthy environment into our constitution and that incorporation uh, just merely tries to ensure environmental concerns are dealt with and to ensure environmental protection. That's what this case is saying. Now, we all know that there is need for development, especially for underdeveloped countries, for developing countries. There is need for development. It is a necessity for human beings. However, there's a dilemma between the need for environmental protection and sustainable economic development. And um, the principles like the principle of sustainable development, the precautionary principle and so forth, are all trained to marriage between ecology and the economy. They're trying to look at how do you strike a balance between resource conservation, management and of the, the depletion and exploitation of non-resource, non-renewable resources. So there are various principles that have tried to tackle that. Uh, and those principles are translated into legislation, there are various provisions and um, mechanisms that have been set out so that we ensure environmental protect protection despite our need to uh, industrialize, our need to achieve development. Now, this is not just an empty statement. We are all familiar with our national goal for a middle-income society, our Vision 2030. We are seeing the roads that are being created, um, and, and it is a very necessary development. As we can see, we, we needed those changes in our countries, right? Um, and from the need to control the pollution, to have fresh water, water pollution, noise pollution, we look into all those things during this course and we see who should bear the cost. We want to urbanize, we want to do all these things. What mechanisms are there to ensure environmental protection, legal mechanisms? We'll look at all those things. Now, it is very, it is a very important case, the Charles Martel case, uh, Charles Martel arbitration case, a case uh, between the U.S. versus Canada. It lays out various principles, um, and it looks at um, what happens when there is transboundary harm, um, when activities of one state affects the activities of another. Please look into that case, read up on that case. Um, I, to, my, to my knowledge, I think I give I gave you food uh, text or details of, for that case in your notes. Now, um, this transboundary harm is important because we have principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration, which, is rec which recognizes the sovereignty of each state upon its natural resources emphasizing that it is limited by the responsibility for transboundary harm. So we know the state principle of state sovereignty that we should govern our own people, but what then happens if our own people's behavior affects other people in another state? So 
this case of the Charles Motor arbitration uh, does into that and there are certain principles that you can draw from that case please read up on that case yes is that um, states have this quote from the principles is a state have in accordance with the charter of the united states and the principles of international law sovereign right to exploit the environmental policies and the responsibility to ensure that their activities within their jurisdiction do not cause uh damage to other states so there's these principles stem from the trial the small term arbitration case read up on that case now We'll constantly be coming back to the principle of sustainable development because I believe it is very central to environmental protection. It is an involved principle that encompasses uh, different themes, themes which, according to Stan's ascents, are four recurring themes. The principle of intergenerational equity to ensure that the activities of today's generation do not affect tomorrow's generation, right? Uh, our uh, exploitation of resources should not uh, detrimentally affect the future generation. Well, the principle of sustainable use, we should ensure that even in our use of resources, we should do it sustainably to ensure that the resources are enjoyed equally with regard to the environment and we have the principle of equitable use of intragenerational equity and the principle of integration so within the principle of sustainable development itself they encompasses these four recurring themes these principles that are within that principle it is very important because the all those environmental problems that we we're talking uh, before the need to balance between urbanization or industrialization with environmental protection. This principle is trying to create that balance between economic, social, and um, uh, and other kind of factors that would affect development. We have to be considered. So Emma, it. Um, Defines sustainable utilization is the use or exploitation of the environment which guards against the extinction, depletion, and degradation of any natural resources and permits the replenishment of natural resources by natural means or other otherwise. So, the three pillars of sustainable development we're looking at environmental, economic, and social uh, awareness when, in, when you're dealing with any development. So this is a conceptual framework for environmental law. Thank you.